Uh, I'm very happy to be here again, California, again, Southern California. Um, and this is a wonderful opportunity to talk about uh, the Amazon and to talk a little about uh, also the United States. Uh, so for me, it's a special night here in Orange County in this Chapman University uh, with students that are interested in literature and write. That's my job. Uh, and I'm very happy when I see young people uh, that want to be writers in this beginning of a new millennium, not really very artistic millennium that we have this beginning. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start. Uh, don't wait a speech, a very specialized in theories of literature. I'm a practical, I'm a professional writer. I'm very practical about literature. Uh, sometimes the critics, I'm very surprised about the things they wrote about. I didn't realize I was doing things that the critics saw in my, my books and my writing. But that's wonderful because each one in his place, we write, the reader reads, the crit critics. No. Uh, so I'm going to start to read some parts of my first novel, The Emperor of the Amazon. I'm going to start to read a few pages in Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese. That, that's like, uh, for, for Portugal, it's like Americans and the British. So there is a, a lot of difference between our Portuguese. There is sometimes we can't understand a single word that a Portuguese is speaking, uh, like they can understand some words we speak in Brazil. But it, that's wonderful also. Uh, Floresta Latifoliada. Esta é uma história de aventura onde o herói, no fim, morre na cama de velhice. E quanto ao estilo, o leitor há de dizer que finalmente o Amazonas chegou em 1922. Não importa, não se faz mais histórias de aventura como antigamente. Em 1922, do Gregoriano Calendário, o Amazonas ainda sublimava o latifoliado parnasianismo que deu dores de cabeça a uma palmeira de Euclides da Cunha. Agora estamos fartos de aventuras exóticas e mesmo de adjetivos clássicos. E é possível dizer que este foi o último aventureiro exótico da planície. Um aventureiro que assistiu às notas de mil réis, acender os charutos e confirmou de cabeça o que a lenda requentou. Depois dele, o turismo multinacional. Folha de rosto. A tinta já anda meio desbotada por aqui e algumas traças se locupletaram em alguns adjetivos. Mas a história começa falando sobre um triângulo de terras que pertencia aos índios Amoacas, Arara, Canamari e Puriná. Parece que nos mapas bolivianos daquela época, o triângulo estava assinalado como Tierras Nordecobiertas. Era um triângulo de moléstias tropicais e rios tortuosos, encravado entre a Bolívia, Peru e o Brasil. Enfim, um lugar que nenhum cristão procuraria para juntar seus trapos. Mas um cearense que não tinha trapos saiu de sua terra e avançou pelas barrancas de um rio sinuoso, enfrentando os ipurinais. O cearense conseguiu fazer uma barraca e escreveu ao visconde de Santo Elias, poderoso comerciante de Belém, pedindo algumas mercadorias. Os ipurinais chamavam aquele rio de Aquiri. O cearense, pouco afeito à arte da caligrafia, rabiscou este nome no envelope que o visconde, depois de muito trato, decifrou como Acre. O visconde começava a fazer um bom negócio sem saber que batizara também um território. O Acre era rico de belos espécimes de Eva brasiliense e viveria por muitos anos sob o signo dos equívocos. Well, now I'm going to read in English a little bit more than in Portuguese to not bore you. Uh, the novel in, in, in the United States called The Emperor of the Amazon, there's this pocket book just by Avon, but you, you are not going to find my books now in bookstores because I left Avon 
and uh, well, I, I have a little problem with Avon, but I, I didn't. My agent, they start to negotiate the new editions of my books here, including the new novel that it never came out in the, in, the Nazi, in the United States. I published five novels in the United States. And that was the first one. In, in 98, it came out in the United States. The translation is by Thomas Koch. The Life and Unprecedented Adventures of Don Luis Galvez Rodriguez de Aria in the Fabulous Cities of the Amazon, including a farcical conquest of the territory of Acre, set forth with perfect equilibrium of artistry, raciocination for the delight of the reader. Beyond the equator, everything is permitted. 50th century Portuguese proverb. Not quite, Luis Galvez deposed. Part one, November 1897 to November 1898. Latifoliated forest primeval. This happened to be an adventure store where in the end, the hero actually dies of old age in his bed. As for its style, the reader will undoubtedly complain that it smacked too much of the Art Nouveau of the 90s. But no matter, they just don't make adventure stories like they use it to do. Nowadays, exotic adventure and classical adjectives are completely out of fashion. Not to mention the broad lifted school of Parnassianism is still extolled in the Amazonas on the early 20s. And it's perhaps even possible to claim that this was the last exotic adventure of the know. In the vast dark Amazonian basin, an adventure who actually witnessed those cigars being lit in one by one by $100 bills, confirming firsthand what legend later rekindled. After him, multinational tourism. Equatorial Fenimore Cooper, in 1945, an old Spaniard decided to write his memoirs. The fellow lived in Cadiz, was then retired and had been tethered down for quite some time. Yet he had once loved to travel, and by his hair friends, he was taken for a consummate liar. In Spain, thought the lie has all had a certain savor and in the Amazon as well. The old man filled ships of pages with a whole series of extravagance, the same one his friends were accustomed to listening to such, with such skepticism. He did not trouble himself about this. However, and knew that those very extravagance constituted the relevant facts of his life. A life, moreover, which, which was relevant only for having been spent in a so irrelevant place. The old fellow died in 1946 and left no, no heirs. He had, however, apparently already completed the memoirs in question because the entire bundle of papers written in a firm, legible hand was to be found some 20 years later, still in fair condition enclosed in a cardboard portfolio. And like any good adventure story worth of the name, it was finally discovered at one of those second-hand bookstores in Paris by a Brazilian tourist in 1973. How this manuscript left Cadiz and actually come to rest on the shelf of a bookinist over on the Boulevard Saint-Michel, it's still something of a mystery. What is certain is that the Brazilian, who was out rummaging through the antiquarian shops along the Bois de Michel, acquired the manuscript, which was drafted in Portuguese, for 350 francs, at the time not a ultrageous sum, rather a good buy even for a relevant manuscript. Well, it took two days to read in the Brazilian, thinking of the romantic novelist José de Alencar who had done something very similar 
with his War of the Peddlers, decided to edit and publish it in Brazil. The Brazilian was none other than myself. And I confess to be being rather taken with the extravagance of this 19th century Spaniard. At any rate, from his yellow stack of papers, discovered in such a queer fashion, as Alencar himself might have said, I have patched together this narrative, which is now being brought into print. And still, harking back to my Alencar, our own equatorial Cooper, let me likewise say to the reader, reconcile thyself to the world, which is but the master puppeteer of such plaything. As for myself, I hope to at last be able to recoup the 35 uh, francs, 30, 30, 50 francs, 100 francs, I spent on the manuscript, which was to have paid for, among other, among other things, my bus trip to Nice and a dinner at Le Balkan. Postcard. In, 19, in 1898, a July night in Berlin, capital of Pará, I begin the tale of my life in mid voyage at the age of 39. From my memory arise a moon, spilling a tarnished glow on the water. The normally crowded popular market get the best is an empty silhouette. And at that late hour of the night, the streets have finally become a little cooler. The house, dark, electrified street lamps attract the hundreds of moths which flutter, which flutter and fall to the ground, reeling in gusts of confetti. From of the Bay of Guajara comes a soft breeze they call the Marajó, after an aliveness of the same name. It hours the heat somewhat, but also mingles the stench of tide with the musty odors of bilge water. The whole area, which smells of pungent coumarin and tulip pools, is a particularly full quarter of the city, full of rotting garbage and street muck. And the alleys offering access to the marketplace are precariously lit at best. So three is little, there is little movement along them in, at this hour. Only a few stragglers pass by, poemians most likely, while I lie comfortably discounted in the delightful little alcove, or so I seem, it seem. Allegro politico conjugal one. Because while I was so eagerly petting a certain perfumed body, down below on the street, walking Luis Truco, better known as Don Luis, the fourth, the moment solitary and quite disgusted official representative of Bolivia. It happened that Don Luis could no longer bear the monotony of this fin de siècle evenings in Berlin. Personally, I did not share his negativity. For a number of years, the rubber trade had offered an easy path to enrichment, and the Amazon had become something of an ideal testing ground. In this part of the world, the dissipation of the acquired wealth was carried out with such prodigious ostentation that there was not enough Im imagination left to overcome its monotony. And so they turned into sin for lack of imagination. Louis Strook seemed to me to be a rather cosmopolitan fellow who simply was accustomed to the more varied offering of seats like Milan and Buenos Aires, where he had previously served. For someone like him, it must have grown tiresome to frequent the same cafes and inns over and over, with always the same crowd of customers, a noisy, hurried clientele, with little aptitude for genuine conversation. Druk had, therefore, adopted the habit of indulging himself in endless walks, pursing his rancor, and in the pre dawn hours of the early summer morning, and in the actual crowd, he has sought the tranquility of the fortress at the edge of the old city, where he might sit on the low stone wall overlooking the river. He may well have had reason to be pensive, but the play of light will have had reason 
but the play of light upon the water seemed palliative to his woes. Yes, our, uh, uh, yes, our truck was a very troubled fellow, occupying, as he did, an extremely sensitive post in the Bolivian diplomatic service. Now, I, I'm going to stop here because the, it's not a big novel. Uh, I'm, I'm skip this part, so I'm uh, just uh, go to the end, let's say, when the, the character become the emperor of an empire in the middle of the jungle. Uh, it's a uh, small chapter, let's say. Ideology of monoculture, first. A collection, a collection of well-rehearsed legs clad in lacy stockings, a few can, can numbers, and plenty of good liquor prove it to be a persuasive and ideological argument as any other. Ideology of monoculture, second. Politics in the tropics is really a question of choreography. Ideology of monoculture, three. The ruling class in the tropics is a shaming of nothing. <laughs> Ideology of monoculture, four. To be violent in the tropics is simply a question of temperament. Thank you. Well, uh, well, you, are, you already know that I come from the Amazon. I'm born in Manaus. Uh, it's the capital of the state of the Amazon. If you look in the map of South America, Manaus is just in the heart of the, the Amazon region, in the middle of South America. Uh, it's an old city. It was founded by the Portuguese in the 17th century, in 1666. It was a Portuguese fortress in the beginning. Uh, they becomes a city with the rubber boom, with the rubber money that comes from the rubber. Uh, now, Manaus is a two million people living there. Uh, it's an industrial city. Uh, the state of the Amazon has an industrial economy. That's why our uh, forest is untouched. Unto there is no problem with the destruction of the jungle in the Amazon state because we don't have a cattle ranching and agro-industrial economy. We have our economy based especially in industry, non-polluted industry that's in Manaus, the capital of the state. We, uh, all the television sets and uh, DVD players, Blu-ray players, and that uh, is sell all over Latin America are produced in Manaus. You can export by, by, the, by, by Brazil for the rest of, of the country and for some Latin American countries. Uh, and we have a long cultural tradition in, in Manaus. Uh, but uh, at first, uh, I, didn't want, I, 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 didn't, I, I, I wanted to be a movie director, not a writer. I, I didn't think to be a writer at first. I, I, I love cinema. I still love cinema. and. Uh, Decided to leave Manaus to study in Sao Paulo, because Sao Paulo there was uh, also a movie industry, and I decided to go to study in Sao Paulo to to work in the movie industry and to become a movie director. In the 60s, it was very charming to be a movie director in Brazil. Uh, to be a movie director in the 60s was like to be a poet in the 19th century during the abolition movement in Brazil. And so, uh, but I, I thought to be a movie director because uh, I felt that there was no uh, dialogue between the Amazon and the rest of Brazil. There was no exchange. You know, there was Brazil far from the Amazon, and the Amazon, no dialogue, no, no exchange, nothing. So I thought maybe if movies is a mass communication form of Tell, to tell stories and to propose things, probably I, maybe I can uh, establish a dialogue with Brazil doing movies. 
And then that was what moved me to go to Sao Paulo to start there. And in fact, I, I went to the university. I graduated in social science by the University of Sao Paulo, and I work in the movie industry in Sao Paulo. I become a screenwriter. I love it, to be a screenwriter. Probably I wrote the worst the screen for the worst films ever made by the Brazilian <laughs> movie industry. But I learned a lot, all commercial, bad commercial films. Well, I was, that was my job. They, they asked me to write, and I have to write the, what they want. But I learned a lot of things, the art of writing, and the conscience that there was, uh, the, the act of writing didn't finish on the paper or in the, print, uh, the uh, printed page. There is another uh, side of the, the, the writing that is the reader or the audience in the case of movies. Then I, I, uh, well, I start to work as screenwriter, but in, in my, uh, 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 in, uh, sometimes I went to work as a crew member you know, in the production to learn more. And one day uh, I was invited by the producer, uh, my boss, to direct a film. He, he got this copyright of a novel, a Portuguese novel, by a Portuguese author, Ferreira de Castro. It's called The Jungle. It's a very famous uh, early 20th century, that's from the 30s, uh, novel about the Amazon. And one of the most important uh, Portuguese uh, 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 writers uh, he lived in the, in the Amazon in the 20s, and he went to, to the jungle, he went to the rubber plantation, and he, he survived this, and he wrote about his experience. It's a wonderful novel. And he, he got the copyrights to do uh, uh, movies, so he invited me to, to make the direction, to direct this production in the Amazon. So we went with the, through all the crew to the Amazon with actors, and came from Portugal, a, a, a Portuguese actor, to, to, to do the main character, Alberto. And uh, I finished the film, I, we shot the film. It's a very expensive production. It's a period, from a period of production. From, it was shot in 1971. Uh, film, the film was in, uh, the period of the film was the early 20s. Uh, in the Amazon, so there is all the problems were a period film and a production with a hundred extras and many problems I have to cope with my first experience. When I went back to Sao Paulo to uh, edit the film and uh, to finish the film, the final production, I realized during the editing that uh, I didn't know nothing about the Amazon. I was born in the Amazon, and I was completely, it could be made by a Chinese or a, a Swedish director, uh, the film, because really I didn't know nothing. I, I didn't, uh, the Amazon was completely strange for me, because I'm from Manaus. Manaus is a urban, uh, I'm urban, I, I live in a big city, and we go to the airport, and we go to Paris, we go to Sao Paulo, we go to Rio de Janeiro, we go to New York. Uh, and, and you can born and be raised in Manaus and never have any contact with the Amazon region, with the jungle. I myself am scared to death with the jungle. When I have to go to the jungle, I go like, you, you, I'm going to a safari in Africa. I have, I have all the shots I have to get from from the, the hospital there and everything, I've been prepared to go to the jungle because I'm not romantizing nature. Nature is dangerous. He wanna kill you, no? Uh, if you don't make some reverence for the nature, he, she, she's very mean. And, um, but I didn't know nothing. I didn't know nothing about the story of my, the history of my, my city, nothing, nothing. Then I was very ashamed. Uh, at first, my colleagues in the school, uh, my professor asked me about the Amazon. I didn't know nothing to answer to them. But then I realized with the film, you know, I decided to go back. I was living in Sao Paulo at the time, working this mover production company, you know, Servicini. 
then I decided to leave. Uh, I, I was having a political problem. It was a dictatorship in Brazil at this time. And was, I was uh, uh, opposi I made opposition for the dictatorship, so I have a, a lot of, I've been three times arrested. So Sao Paulo was really a good, there was a, the climate of Sao Paulo. It was a, good for my health. So I decided to go back to my, my hometown, to Manaus. Uh, to work in a, in a uh, advertise agents, I was uh, there to work this, and at the same time to start to know what was to be a native from the Amazon and what was the Amazon. Bom, well, together with this, the film results a disaster. Now, I'm no Glauber Rocha, I'm no Janu Godard. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, you see, the film is really bad. Real, uh, I have a nightmare that I go to a rental video store and the film is there to be rented. <laughs> it's so bad that uh, the author, Ferreira de Castro, he was senior citizen of Portuguese literature. He went to, this, to the movies to see the film in Portugal. And he was so mad with the film, that he died another day. I killed him with the film. Yeah, that's why I killed him. I, I, so I decided to give up the cinema. I didn't want to become a serial killer of writers. I decided to give up this. But the movies was very important for me. I still love movies. Sometimes I write scripts, screen writes for for movies, but uh, what I like, what I love to do was to write the scripts, not to go to the set to, to the filming, the problem, because movies concentrate. I, I do theater, I love, I still, I direct plays, I direct operas, but this plays go for a whole year, so all the conflict is diluted in one year. I, I, movies concentrate three, four, seven weeks and there everything happened in seven weeks you have to cope with all the problems and yet in the end you make a lousy film and a terrible film no, I decided no thank you uh, I'll be writing uh, my books and uh, it was a, deci a, a difficult decision because I, I really want to be a movie director and when I was working in this advertising agent I had this script that, that I wrote, uh, that I dreamed to direct, it was about this character of Luis Galvez. And that became the novel, The Emperor of the Amazon. I, got, I took the script, then I started to write as a novel. And I worked for two years, this text, I didn't show for anybody, even for my friend, for my wife, I was keeping secret, locking my, uh, some place there. And uh, after two years, uh, I started to do movie, uh, to to go, uh, to do theater. I was invited to direct a play uh, in a very traditional group company. I still working with them since this, since 1972. Uh, I was invited to direct a, a, a concert of music and poetry. And I was fascinated with theater. I, I, I liked theater also. I, I never realized that I could be, for me, who wanted to do movies, theater is something old fashioned, medieval, from the Middle Age, you know, for, uh, for the, someone who loves movies. But then I realized that there was another language, that it was possible to be a writer. It's a too personal job. You know? To write, you, you are alone. Nobody can help you, no? You are yourself and you're, you're what you want to tell in the, the white paper. And that's it, that's it. Not theater. Theater is that it's collective. It's a lot of people thinking and creating together. As a director, you have to work with a lot of people. So this, it, it was, for me, was fantastic. Because I could go all day alone by myself writing my novels 
And when night came, I would go to the theater and find a lot of crazy people and a lot of creative people, and I could work differently from and this made a big change in my, my first draft of this novel because I was, uh, after this, uh, this concert, I started to work in a, in a play about the rubber boom that becomes, a, I wrote this musical play, it's called uh, Rubber Follies, that tells the story of the rubber boom through small scenes, like the, the Follies, like the the old-fashioned theater from the beginning of the 20th century. And so it's, uh, there were some pieces. It's not a, a, a direct story that begins, there is middle and the end. It's some pieces of moments of history in different, like uh, you'll see this common magic number where the musician that uh, saw the woman in the middle, and there was a moment like this when the Americans tried to saw part of the Amazon region in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so we use different kind of language in all dance, all, all thing and uh, the, the play. Then I started to rewrite this novel to make, uh, I cut in pieces the novel to replicate in the literature, literature that, that experience to make at pieces the history of the past of the Amazon. Uh, the emperor of the Amazon was, I, I finished this new version in uh, 1976. In, uh, a friend of mine, he went to the government, to, he went to become, he's become secretary of culture of, the, of my, my state at the Amazon. And he wanted to publish uh, uh, very cheap books, popular books, with authors, local authors. He knew that I have this novel. And he asked me to give to be published. I didn't want, because I had a, a bad experience with publishing books before. In 1968, before I go to Sao Paulo, to, to, to the university, I published a, a, a book about, uh, with my critics that I wrote in the newspaper movie critics, all the critics I, I, I collect in this volume, in the publish this volume, it's called uh, The Shadow, uh, the Shadow Watcher. Uh, and uh, it was a thousand copies. It was published by the, the Authors Guild of the Amazon. They, they published four books uh, among my, it was among my books in this fourth collection. It was uh, in the early uh, 76, it, it came out. And, uh, no, I, I mean, in 68, 68 came this book, and they sent the thousand copies to my house. <laughs> and it's a lot of books, a thousand books. <laughs> Occupied the living room of my mother. At the, at the time, I lived with my family, my parents, my relatives, my father, my mother. And it occupied all the living room. And my, my mother was asking me every day, when this box will leave this place? I can't receive anybody here because of those, those books. And I said, don't worry, mother. I'm giving to my friends. But then you realize you don't have a thousand friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, dra the tragedy. I, I was meeting my friends in the street. They said, no, no, I don't want any more. You will give me seven times this book. I was really shocked when it was, you see, it's more easy to get rid of a body. You kill somebody, you cut in pieces, you send by the post officer, but not a book. <laughs> it's terrible. I, I spent years to get rid of those thousand copies. I'm so shocked with this that I never ever published this book, I never published again. Then he asked me, I said, no, I don't want to publish it. No, thank you very much. So, then he stayed, he, he went every day in my house. I said, okay, you can, you can post, but I don't want any copy here in my house. You take, I, I want, I, I have three or four friends that I want to give. <laughs> then I go there, I pick up this copies and I, uh, I'll give as a present. But you, you keep the copies. Okay, so he, he didn't know what happened. And so he published the, he published the book and uh, the book uh, 
uh, came out in September 1976. And uh, it was a thousand copies. And uh, after one month, he called me in October and said, come here uh, in the secretary that I have some things to talk with you. And so I went there and he says, oh, it sold out all that thousand copies. Here is your check, was my first copyright in my life. Here's your check. And I want a new contract to print a second edition. And I said, I can't, I can't do any more of this because I have four offers from publishing house, uh, eight offers, I mean, four from Sao Paulo, four from Rio, wanted to publish this novel. And so I can't sign here anymore because uh, I need a more professional edition. So, And then in 1977 came out the first national edition of the Emperor of the Amazon by uh, the main publishing house there was in Brazil at the time, Civilização Brasileira. It, this, be published by Civilização, it's like to be published by Gallimard in France at the time. For me, it was a dream. I went to Rio de Janeiro. All the great Brazilian writers were was there to meet the, this savage that's coming from the Amazon with this, this novel. And it was really fantastic what happened because the, the, I, 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 I couldn't imagine that this, this could happen. The emperor was, um, the next week, the, 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 it was in the list of bestsellers and uh, become uh, the second place in the list of bestsellers in the 77, 78 in Brazil. In 1980, the book came out in the United States, in September also. September is the month. So. Mm. And uh, the book came out here, translated by Thomas Couch, who was also my literary agent at that time. Couch invited me to come to my Persian house, Avon at the time, invited me to come to make presentations, some readings in New York, Boston, uh, Philadelphia. And so I arrived in New York, Kennedy Airport, where Thomas was really happy there to receive me and he said, look, look here in New York, there was a, a, a text in New York about the book and he said, for the first time, the New York is publishing a critic about a non-hardcover book. It's your novel because it's so, it was published in this edition. And do you know what that means? I said, no, I don't have any. I have some fantastic idea of this. Today, you sold 5,000 copies only in the bookstore of Manhattan with this uh, critic in, uh, in uh, New Yorker. And, and from the airport to the, uh, the hotel, Thomas told me the story of my arrival, arrival in New York from the the day they invited me to the day I arrived there. Because Avon published those books, very well done, 30,000 copies. Because they sell this for 10 years, they spend 10 years selling this in the universities, schools that teach, they are teaching in Latin America literature, Brazilian literature, so. In the first week, uh, it, they sold 10,000 uh, 10, copies. At first, they had booked me in a hotel in Soho, in New York, that belongs to the Catholic Church. My agent told me that it's a wonderful hotel. I've never been there. Uh, it's a hotel that usually the missionaries, Catholic missionaries, come from Africa or from the Amazon with some tropical disease to, to be held in New York, so they stay in this hotel. It's, a, it's, a nice, it's supposed to be a nice place. But I sold 10,000 copies, so I could stay with missionary with yellow fever <laughs> in New York. So they transferred me to 46th Street in Manhattan. It's called Little Brazil. So he, they thought, well, he can stay with the stewardess of Varig Airlines, Brazilian Airlines, to get, so they can speak Portuguese. There is, in this hotel, there is a, a big uh, blow up of a photo of Pelé, so he'll be, be home. They, I sold 20,000 copies. So they said, no, he can't stay in the 46th Street. He's going to stay in Waldorf Astoria. 
it's uh, because there there is the Brazilian Carnival every year, and the world also is going to stay. They, we sold out all the thirty thousand copies, and they put me in a fancy hotel in Central Park South. Uh, they pay everything, but I have to give the tips. <laughs> Imagine the tips in this hotel. Open the elevator, $10, close the elevator, $10. Now, 10% of the, the breakfast was something to make you bankrupt. <laughs> well, I have to stay there for this. But the, what surprise, the big surprise, first, I could understand why the, the, the American readers were so interested. I, I, Thought where well, maybe it's the exotic, maybe it's because of the Amazon. Sure, the Amazon is an attraction, of course. But after I been reading, and the contacts I made with the students in in IU and uh, in Columbia, and in a high school in Brooklyn, uh, were my best contacts I have in New York with readers because they have to read the book. The professor. No, they were there uh, to see if they were, have read in the books. That uh, uh, what they were, what they loved in the book was the the way we uh, I cope with the European culture. No, uh, and this is a very common. This is a, a line. It's a, a line inside the history of Brazilian literature. Brazil produced all kind of literature, literature, from romantic commercial literature to, to very experimental literature. And we have moments that we have, for instance, in the 20s of the 20th century, there was the avant-garde. We have modernism in Brazil that is completely different to the concept of modernism in American literature and in the uh, Hispanic literature. For us, uh, this so-called modernism in the United States, in the, the, uh, the Latin American literature, is some literature from the 19th century. The, the novel, Brazilian novels, that looks like Catherine Porter or uh, Don Segundo Sombra, are, sounds like a 19th century novel in Brazil. Because uh, the author, like John dos Passos, looks like the Brazilian literature from this period, the 20s. And uh, I love it. I love when Brazilian writer from this period. It's my, uh, Oswald de Andrade. He wrote novels very funny, very radical about the Brazilian society. And, uh, and also we have in the turn of the century, the 19th and 20th century, uh, one of the great authors Probably the great American author that we have in all the continent, that's Machado de Assis. And in the end of his life, he writes a novel uh, that uh, showed the ruling class in Brazil as they were. A, a, a lot of crazy people, completely stupid, uh, and with a lot of irony, a lot of sense of humor. And this man, uh, he, he was uh, very mean with his characters. The novels are fantastic. So I got those two kinds. They, they, they don't have both Oswald de Andrade. Also, they proposed the, uh, uh, a manifest. He wrote a manifest in 1925. It's called Anthropophagic Manifest. He proposed that we have to eat all the European culture and to eat, to devour, and to give back as a Brazilian, as Brazil, and go deep to the, the roots of Brazil through this uh, eating this, the best that there are in the avant-garde culture of Europe. And I, I was uh, following this tradition of Brazilian. It's no, uh, it was new in the 70s, this novel. Uh, the way that's funny, uh, it's uh, in a moment very sad of the Brazilian history. The Brazilian literature in general in this period was very sad. And then suddenly this comes this novel, uh, mocking with history, with the seriousness of history, because uh, the, the military thinks that Brazil has the best history all over the, 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 from 
uh, you know, uh, militaries you know, in power. Uh, you didn't have, I hope, never, just here in the United States. But uh, it was a very sad moment in Brazil. And uh, this uh, happiness that brings the novel, I think, that in Brazil made the success of the book, critic from the critic and from the public. And in the United States was this no ceremonies toward the European culture that, that make the, uh, the, the students uh, very curious about this and to know better about uh, the avant-garde in Brazil. Uh, of course, John dos Passos, he deals with avant-garde, but he has no sense of humor. No, he's quite serious what he writes. He's wonderful, I love John dos Passos. No. But uh, he, he, didn't, he, he didn't fit in the sense of modernism that we understand in Brazil. Uh, well, then uh, my generation in Brazil, uh, people who start to, to publish his books in the 70s, in the 80s, during the, the military dictatorship, uh, was we have two generations that has connection with the reading public. It's the Brazilian writers of the early 20th century. Uh, the poet Olavo Bilac, uh, novelists uh, like José de Alencar, or novelists like Joaquim Manuel de Macedo, novelists uh, like Aloysio Azevedo, they were quite popular, even in a small population, in a small population of people who could read novels. But uh, uh, looking the the archives of Machado de Assis, we can under, we can see that he could live by only writing in Brazil, because he received a lot of copyrights. Authors like Essa de Queiroz was more popular in Brazil. He sold more. He got more money in Brazil than in Portugal because of the population. So this generation of the early 20th century was very uh, professional. Olavo Bilac only do, he was a poet, he only wrote literature. When he was needing money, he wrote some advertising for uh, advertising agents, but he always lived by his pain. Aloysio Azevedo, uh, he was a wonderful uh, Brazilian novelist from the, the the tw early 20th century, he wrote about his job as a writer, and he tells, he tells in this, uh, I can live, I can, I can make my live by writing, and I can, I can buy my bread by, with the money I own with my writing. One day, I will have the butter also. Mm -hmm. no. And uh, the Baron of Rio Branco, a great politician, he was the founder of the Brazilian diplomacy, and he was the Minister of Foreign Affairs in the Empire, Brazilian Empire. He invited, he, he loved his, uh, he loved the, the novels of Arthur Azevedo, and he was his friend of Dialuizio Azevedo, his brother, he was a playwright, very popular at the time to me. Well, also, uh, uh, Aloysio, uh, he invited Luiz and said, oh, look, I'm going to send you as a consul of Brazil in Puta del Este. There is nothing to do. Then you can get the money from the, the, the Minister of Brazilian Foreign Relations and you can work freely. He never wrote anymore when he became a diplomat. He couldn't write anymore. He just could looking for his butter. He found the butter, he finished with the writer. But uh, just to tell how popular were those writers. The modernists, on the contrary, they were all rich people. They didn't need to be professional. Oswald de Andrade probably was the richest Brazilian writer for all history of the Brazilian literature. He owned half of the downtown Sao Paulo. Can you imagine this in the 20s, in the 30s, until the 50s? He was selling land and going to the casinos. He, 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 he went to Paris, and he was in Paris in the Ritz, and he was receiving all the great writers in, in France, uh, spending money. Uh, well, so 
he publishes himself his, his books. No. And he doesn't matter if his soul he has given for everybody. He doesn't matter if he, there was a distribution of the book. So this tradition of the author to, with readers in Brazil was cut by the modernists. They improved the language, improved the static, improved literature, but they make go back to the 19th century, the, 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 the professional, to be professional. Together with the United States, Brazil is the only country in Americas where you can choose to be a writer, professor, a writer, civil servant, or just be a writer. Is it possible to, be, to do that? I do this since 1976. Oh, I, oh, now, uh, I publish a lot of novels uh, and plays, I direct plays, and uh, I finished, I just finished a tetralogy of four volumes. I published three volumes about the, the end of the, about the, the 18th and 19th century, the first half of the 19th century, when the Amazon didn't belong to Brazil. And how the Brazilian Empire invades the, the, the Portuguese colony in annex, the annexation of the, this, the north of the, the, the Brazilian territory. Uh, and I, I just finished, I've sent to my publishing house in Rio my, uh, the last installment of this tetralogy. And I'm starting to write a novel about young Brazilian pilots in the Second World War. Brazil was the only Latin American country who went to war together with the Allies and fought in the front of Italy in, in the Second World War. And so so that there's a story of these young people who love velocity from the high middle class in Rio who become pilots of the Brazilian Air Force, crazy young people who make crazy things in the Second World War. I hope this will be translated in English. Thank you very much.